Right, good afternoon everyone. So, um, my name is Dean Wood, and I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the key of life cycle and uh, product design, I suppose, and how you can add lots of value at every stage of the Kiosk life cycle, not just through hardware development. Uh, so I'm a designer, I'm a product design graduate, um, one of the founders of Evoke in its current disguise, I suppose. Uh, so we started Evoke around 2006-2007 when we moved into the Kiosk industry from a product design consultancy. Um, I'm not sure if anyone is aware of Evoke in here, it's probably a few people, uh, sort of clients, competitors. Um, we work with some of the world's largest brands, as I mentioned previously, 2007 was our sort of entry into the market uh, with a traditional sort of product design project really. So beforehand we were a company called Raffo Design and we used to develop everything from, I suppose, ideal standard bathrooms, JCB controls, uh, furniture, complex medical devices. So really as a product design agency we were accustomed to working with really complex things, understanding problems, understanding users' needs, really against the, the gritty of issues. Uh, 2007, we saw an opportunity to develop uh, a self-service machine. I suppose back when there weren't really self-service machines as we know today, the iPhone was being released that year. So we saw it as an opportunity. Um, Small-scale manufacturer, me and Neil, co-founder, uh, thought at that stage, let's make this product, let's become a manufacturer. I suppose we've not looked back since. We took the values that we had in our product design consultancy, applied them probably to an industry which at its time was fairly new, fairly uh, engineering led. There were metal manufacturers who were kind of doing this product and it seemed like a good synergy for us. We could kind of bring something fairly new to an industry which was requiring it, so I'm hopefully trying to disrupt a little bit. Um, so what is design? Um, as a, I suppose, as an example, it's a very ambiguous term. Um, often misused in some cases, um, very subjective, um, but I suppose one way of summing up in my opinion is, um, is a discipline or a way of uh, creating a product or service with the intention of improving the human experience. I suppose that's key for me, not just prettifying something, not just developing something which looks nice, but something which actually adds value, it improves someone's experience, it improves someone's life. I think that's key to design. Um, don't get me wrong, this product is beautiful, it's fantastic, it's a product that sells very well, I own this product, but if you've ever used it, it's an awful piece of design in lots of aspects. It, it, the lemon goes everywhere, it doesn't drip into the cup, you can't put in the dishwasher, it's large, but as a piece of ornament, it's fantastic. As opposed to this utilitarian, works very well, sells very well, but you wouldn't put it on show in your kitchen because it's not the best looking device. So I think. It's trying to find a happy medium between form and function. For me, it's key. It's adding value, but it's also developing something which sells. So you've got to basically consider everyone, not just the client, the end user, who's going to be purchasing it. You're obviously going to sell much more of the previous lemon squeezer, <laughs> but it probably doesn't solve, or it doesn't satisfy the needs maybe of the user from the aesthetic perspective. Um, so what we're trying to do is combine these requirements, and that's kind of where design comes in. It's, it's understanding, it's casting your net and, and dealing with as many of these uh, users, I suppose, as possible. And that's where I see true value being added to the design process. Um, so designing without really having a function or an improvement is really just pretty final doing aesthetic treatments. Um, I know Graham later mentioned in his talk about understanding the user, not just the client, and that's absolutely key. But I think if we go one further than that, it's understanding every user, everyone's going to come in contact with that product. So, designing for the entire product life cycle, and kind of what I mean by that is starting with a blank piece of paper, really. Taking a step back, many of the people in this room have done kiosk projects before, have kiosk projects fail, or they're going into it, you know, with their eyes open. I think the main thing for us is taking a step back, so you may always have an idea in your mind, but we like to start with, with this blank page and start asking the difficult questions often, like why are you doing this project? Um, don't think of a physical product yet. Um, there's lots of elements to a product and it's not just how it looks. For us, it's a full service company. You've got the industrial design, the user interface, the user experience, customer experience, business experience, brand experience, whichever acronyms you want to throw at it. At the end of the day, what we're developing is a service. So it's not just developing a piece of hardware that sits 
on your lobby, you're actually developing how people know about it, how they interact with it when they walk in the store, how they know where it is, how intuitive it is, and then also how easy it is to maintain, dismantle, end of life, what comes next, those kind of things, the whole business change management. So, when we start a project, I think it's absolutely key to ask some difficult questions to understand kind of where the client is at. So are they engaged at the right level? This is often with governance, understanding kind of within their business where they may be at in a project. If someone sees a kiosk at McDonald's and says, we need one of them, that's fantastic, but do you understand what that requirement is? What are your legacy systems? What do you have in place? Are your staff ready for it? Is your infrastructure ready for that kind of bandwidth, that kind of internet? Connectivity. These are the kind of things you need to ask right at the start and design. So we're not just designing a piece of hardware, going and plonking it in your restaurant, and then you've got no internet connection, or you know, it's in just the wrong place. Um, what does success look like? Again, are you being realistic with your project? Are you wanting a 50% uplift on sales? Or are you looking at a certain product line and saying, if I get a 2% uplift, my ROI is three months on that product line? Absolutely key to understand this at the outset. Um, who are the end users? Who are your customers? Age, demographic, are they tech savvy? Um, you know, we work with lots of different brands at different levels of the market, from JD Sports through to Hugo Boss. Very different customer base, very different needs, expectations. You know, some people want to give away information, some people won't have their photograph taken. They, they, you know, it's understanding the customer first, it's absolutely key. I know Graham's going to talk about that later. Um, so, another key point are where are the units being located? So, I don't just mean geographically, but this is key. So, if we're putting a product into 60 countries, it's key that we can get it there, get it at the right price, hit lead times. We need to understand also local laws, ADA compliance, DDA compliance, to make sure that we comply with all those laws wherever it's going. We can actually get it there. On a local level, on a national level, even in the store itself, the people in this room who deploy kiosk projects know that if you put a kiosk in a corner and no one knows it's there, it's going to fail. And at the end of the day, kiosks have kind of been given, I suppose, a bad name. I've been in meetings with very large companies and we can't use the word kiosk because the IT director comes out and hires every year. And so, you know, there's lots of bad practice being done. And I think we need to, uh, from a client perspective or a kiosk manufacturer, Ask these questions at the outset to understand that we start on the right time. Who's going to be installing it? Again, working with incumbents, making it as simple as possible to install. Absolutely key, and it's one of the key things for us as a, as a manufacturer is making sure that it can be transported and installed as, as, as easy as possible without damaging the product, without damaging the person who's installing it as well. Also, training materials, so we do video guides, those kind of things. All these kind of things, these are the questions that we ask at the start, so we understand when we go on a project or on a journey with a client, they kind of understand what's involved. Who's going to be interacting with it again? The users, but this could also be your members of staff. So, for instance, printer rolls, powering on, updates via USB. It's good to know this at the outset. If people are going to be collecting cash, is it in a safe place? You know, is it behind a locked door? What sort of security levels have they got? You know, no exposed wires, all these kind of things are questions that we ask at the outset. Again, are the staff engaged? Many kiosk projects fail because, for instance, you plonk a kiosk in a reception lobby of a hotel, the staff have never seen it before, understand actually what's going in, what is this kiosk, is it taking our job? You come back to the support call because you haven't got connection and they turn them off. That kind of thing happens, or has happened in the past, an awful lot. And getting the staff on board and managing that change management process is absolutely key. McDonald's do it really, really well. We have kiosk champions, you know, JD as well, a fantastic example of a company who implemented digital in a really good way. The staff are on board, the redemption of the actual uh, sales through the kiosk are done at store level, so they don't see that sale going online. So there's lots of things like that where we can work with, uh, we should be working with your client or your business to understand at the outset so that when these things do come to store, the store manager knows about it, they feel they've been consulted. Uh, we just did a project with a Uniqlo where we walked around all their stores in Paris and Germany, Barcelona. We engaged with the staff. They told us the best place to go, the best football. Those little key nuggets of information at staff level are absolutely fine. So start with the bottom up in some instances. Get them engaged. When the kiosk does come in, they feel like they've had a part to 
play in actually that implementation. Um, maintenance, again, it's often a different company who are maintaining it to in installing it. Often what we're trying to do is actually push that maintenance back to members of staff, so where we can actually de-skill the installation and maintenance by using tool-free access, by using really simple video guides which are located on the device themselves. What we're seeing now is we're actually pushing it back to a store level where we're using operationally trained personnel to do that uh, service and maintenance where possible. Um, key functions and components, again, industrial grade. Which components are we going to be using? What's the key function? You know, how does it have to perform? Environmental requirements, temperature, humidity, all these things are key factors which, again, when you're deploying a kiosk into 60 countries, could mean win or lose. Legacy systems, again, it's absolutely key to understand what your business has in place. This is often a real blocker to a project at the start. If you want to do something like McDonald's have done, where you've got a 30-year-old system for your ERP at the back end, I just can't handle anything, no API. You're then going to have to work back with that business to put in place all of these systems so we can actually talk to your existing system. And again, what's already out there? Why haven't people already done it? So sometimes it's a difficult question. Um, if people are already doing it, great. Let's learn from it. Let's see what works and what doesn't work. If someone isn't doing it, why? It's often a, often a difficult question, but there's often a reason why people aren't doing it. Sometimes that's down to factors we can discover early on. And also, what could change? Now, this for us, again, these are all critical questions. Every single one of them must be asked at the outset and must be designed into the product. Technology disruption, end of life of a component, Understanding that whilst still trying to make a product which is beautiful in some aspects, <laughs> meets the client requirement, but understanding that in a couple of years something may go end of life or even sooner, you can't get a component, or something comes along which just changes the whole project itself, the mobile phone, a disruptive technology which means that no longer people want to use kiosks. So with budget, with scale, it, it, it's critical to understand you know, as much as possible what disruptors might be out there and how we can maybe mitigate some of those risks through good design. Um, so looking at the product life cycle, in an ideal world, we speak to every single one of these people. So we've got the clients, obviously, the manufacturer, in some respect, in some instances it's ourselves, logistics companies, installation engineers, the end users, the staff, the support engineers, and then look at end of life. So by engaging with all of these at the outset, and trying to develop a product, obviously you can see in the middle is the ideal scenario. This is often impossible to achieve because you can't really please everyone. But I think the key thing is, is, um, is engage with all these people. Don't necessarily give them equal weighting, but consider them, bring them on board to the project at an early stage. And you've got a much better chance of success. Uh, and this never stops as well. So the product life cycle for us, with all the clients we showed logos up before, we're still working with the majority of those businesses. So we engage with Intelligent, who in our Bibitech in 2007, JD Sports, McDonald's. We now sell probably 10 to 15 different products to many of the brands that we engage with because we add value at every level of this. And this conversation never stops. When you come into an installation, we're now working on the next generation. We're looking at the end of life of this one product and we're looking at doing thought leadership of what could come next or any enhancements or any other products which we could add to the portfolio. So within JD Sports, we've got within the Oxford Street store, I think 60 different touch points from sort of iPad style, iPads at staff level, through to interactive systems, digital signage, large video walls, all at different levels of the store for different uses, but all one hallmark, obviously harmonious, I suppose, ecosystem. Um, so once we've done that, the next steps really are, can it be done, I suppose, is, is asking a difficult question and feedback with the client. The key thing is managing expectation. So, you know, can it be done? Can you do it? Are you engaging? Do we say no? And more often, I'd say more often than not, very often we say it's probably not something we can engage with because at the end of the day, we've been burned so many times and I suppose lots of people in this room have as well on projects that you've invested an awful lot of time in and have absolutely gone nowhere because of governance, because of budget, 
because of the infrastructure that's in place. So I think saying no is very difficult, but it's getting easier specs because of the experience that we've got. Uh, managing all these expectations and risks. So we did take a project on. Understand at the outset what's involved. Uh, this is what we can do. These are the risks. It might not work. We need to move it around, etc., etc. <coughs> move as fast as possible. Again, using sort of analogies of the Concorde, where they sort of took 30 years to develop something and it was massive over budget. We're not living in those times anymore. To get something to fast to market, prototype it quickly, analyze, iterate, and adapt. They're the key things for us really. Is trying to get something to market quickly, possibly using an existing product that we've already made, which we've already made. Uh, okay, this could be adapted slightly. We can get it out of there, do a proof of concept, move it around a bit. Great, does it work? Brilliant. Let's iterate that, let's change it. But I think being quick to market with a lower budget is absolutely key because we can get something out there, we can test it. If it fails, it fails. But we can hopefully have a better chance of making this succeed. <coughs> be agile, really be flexible, I think is a key thing. Uh, so, some examples of where we as Boca have, have kind of taken on these complex projects. So, Bibliotech have been a client with us. Uh, they were the first company who engaged us in 2007. We're now still working with them 10 years later. We've developed around 30 products for them. This is I think, the fourth generation of library kiosks. We probably sold about 15,000 of these into around about 70 countries worldwide. Um, very complex need. You know, they have, if you can see from the next page, I think we have 15 to 20 payment options, depending on where it's going in the globe. We've got DVD unlocker, smart card systems, we've got different glass, different technologies, height adjustment, desktop, wall mounted. So it's a very, very complex set of requirements that they had, which was basically like the worst case of design by committee you could ever have. When they went out to all their markets around the world and said, what do you want in a product? We got the biggest brief in the world, filtered it down, and tried to develop a product which not only satisfied that brief, but still looked Okay, which is often very difficult, is trying to get something which meets that sweet spot. Uh, and I believe we did it. I mean, this is a four year old product now. We've just done some iteration on it. You know, we're always looking at adding new features and improvements to it so it doesn't really stand still. But it's been a fantastic success for us. We've now done next generation. But it just shows kind of all these complex requirements. You need to, at the outset, get as much information as possible and understand where it's going because this goes over to Australia in crates where we can lay it down. So we tried to design that whole system for BIB. McDonald's is probably one of our best examples where we've added the true value at every stage. Uh, McDonald's already had uh, incumbent suppliers, and they still have. We're not the sole supplier for McDonald's. Um, but we saw an opportunity to take the product which they'd, I suppose, had, had a, a prototype of, which looked, it looks the same because they, they control the design. But on the inside of the product itself is where we added the value. So we knew it was very difficult to install because we engaged with the installation engineers. It was difficult to transport because they were sending it on a pallet and it was seven foot tall. So we broke down all of those difficulties that the installation engineers were having and we developed a product which is basically much, much more efficient. So all the components inside it could be replaced without using an engineer. So we actually brought in uh, or suggested, I think, all operationally trained personnel, so they could actually use the members of staff for doing support. So we had a small stock holding of components within the restaurant, and then on the kiosk itself and on the, on, on the tills, there's actually video guides of how to swap things out. So without any training whatsoever, just watching a one-minute video, no tools needed, they can swap the PC, the printer, the bar, and scan, the chip and pin. The, the screen, they could do, but it's a bit heavy, so we bother them to do that. But, the options there, and we've also, we're coming up to the next generation of this now, we've actually added even more sort of efficiencies as well. But that for them is a bit of a game changer because they didn't need much expensive engineering visits. So it's just showing where you can add value at different levels, whereas the physical kiosk looks the same. When you open it up and install it, you decommission it. It's where the value is added to. The other one is Uniqlo, I mentioned previously. So we've been working really close with these guys uh, globally. Um, this product, um, we did a few concepts, we chose this one. High level screen, light box on the bottom which can be changed. Fairly straightforward, uh, standard kiosk design, but they wanted something which could be very adaptable. It could be in a wall, it could be freestanding, wall mounted, it could have a top on it, it could be moved around the store. They, they approached the kiosk project in a really good way. We worked with them in sort of full leadership capacity at the start. 
engaging with their staff in the different stores in Paris, in Germany, in, in, uh, in Spain and the UK. Gave us absolutely great insights, but with this product now has been moved around to go to the French Open. So we developed something which is quite lightweight, robust, and was able to do a proof of concept in multiple countries really quickly. And we've now just done, I suppose, the next generation of this, which has taken on all the feedback. So we've made it slightly thinner, changed the PC spec, the light box at the bottom has changed slightly. So that fast market, we went from concept to installation in around about three and a half weeks with this. So from sitting down, having a conversation in London to actually having the first trial four sites in Paris installed in three and a half weeks now. It's not recommended by any staff, <laughs> don't get me wrong, uh, but it just shows what can be achieved. If you've got a really forward thinking business, you want to do something and we'll work with you. They understood the risks, they, they, their business was really on board with it, they understood that they were putting a the prototype in there uh, and it's been a great success. So we're just putting these into other countries, in America, into the States, into London. Um, so coming to the end of my talk, um, I suppose why do it? I suppose it's been pretty clear why to do it. It's because of success. I think of the kiosk manufacturers in this room, uh, me included, we've had many projects fail because of one of these areas I've spoken about previously, be it the staff not being on board, being the, the, the customer not being engaged, being us being not engaged at the right level. So you haven't got that governance or that buy-in from the right people within that organisation. Um, so I think what I'm trying to get across today is is try to ask those different questions. Understand the whole product life cycle, what's gonna happen at the end of it, what comes next, what is success, how are these things gonna scale? Um, and understanding technology and how things may adapt, how things may disrupt you and the customer. And I think it's our duty as designers and manufacturers to be the thought leader, to give that value, to be that full service company. And I think, you know, the more we do that, the more success we're gonna have, the more the industry's gonna grow, I think because it's going to grow. I mean, if you look at some of the things we're doing now, the kiosk is just one element of a much, much bigger infrastructure. The kiosk at McDonald's is one part of New Part 7, which is a multi-million pound investment for, for a franchisee, and this is just the customer-facing part of it. So, you know, it's, it's understanding kind of everything else that gets wrapped around that and how you can add value to the whole supply chain and the whole product life cycle. Um, so, that's it for me. Thank you very much. Any questions? Anyone?